It really is like someone poured gasoline on my legs and set them on fire. I was never, ever prepared for what I saw. Didn't even look like him. I could barely recognize his face. Knowing the worst is in store for your daughter I mean, is heart-wrenching. I just wanted the pain to go away. What are you going to do for my child? You've got to save her. Next, two medical mysteries that defy the experts. Walt Breidigan's seemingly ordinary life is turned completely upside down when he gains more than 100 pounds in less than 24 hours, forcing his family to face a terrifying reality. I just never thought that somebody could hold that much weight. I kept saying to them, please don't let him die. Please don't let him die. Then, when eight-year-old Ashley Mullinax begins to drink more than three gallons of water a day, little does anyone realize it's a sign of a horrifying disease that could kill her at any given moment. Ashley went from two or three 20-ounce bottles a day to two to three gallons a day. There was something seriously wrong with my child. In the winter of 2005, 48-year-old Walt Breidigan was in the prime of his life. He had a good job working as an engineer, three grown children, and had recently celebrated his 26th wedding anniversary with his wife, Nancy. We became very much in love at an early age. I met Walt when I was in the eighth grade. We were absolutely meant to be together. Nancy is the love of my life. I've loved her since I was 15. And even now, it's as strong as it was when we were 15. Throughout their life, Walt stays nearly as active and fit as he was when they first met. Walt was a very athletic guy, never sat still, always liked to coach, very seldom ever missed work. I had never gone to the hospital and never had any medical conditions. But in February of that year, the usually indestructible Walt wakes up one morning with what seems to be a case of the flu. It was a tired feeling that you could not get out of bed. It seemed like his symptoms were like an upper respiratory virus. My daughter had had the exact same symptoms a week before. I thought, after a couple days, this will pass. I never liked to be off work, so I went into the office. About two hours after I arrived at work, I started getting like these little bursts of light through my vision. I was afraid I was gonna pass out. So I had one of my coworkers call my wife immediately so she could pick me up. He could barely make it to the car. I knew there was something wrong, so we rushed to the doctor's office. The doctor said, let's check your blood pressure and see where it stands. It was like 70 over 50. 120 over 80 is a normal blood pressure. The doctor said, wow, that's a really low blood pressure. Low blood pressure is a condition in which diminished blood flow deprives organs throughout the body of oxygen and other nutrients. Extreme cases can be fatal. This was really odd to me. I had never had anything but good blood pressure. The doctor said that he felt that it was due to dehydration from the upper respiratory virus that he had. The doctor gave me some medication that would raise the blood pressure. With nothing else to do, we just went on. When we got home, I helped him up the stairs into bed. And he felt that if he could lay down and rest, he would be fine. But about an hour later, Nancy is startled by a strange noise coming from upstairs. I ran upstairs to the bathroom, and Walt is passed out on the floor. So I'm screaming his name, saying, Walt, Walt, wake up. In the meantime, I'm yelling for my son to call 911. I actually thought, and when I couldn't bring him to, that he had passed away. 
As soon as the paramedics got there, and the first thing they did was check for a pulse, and they said to me, ma'am, we cannot find a pulse. Well, by this point, I'm like, oh my goodness, we're gonna lose him right here. And I kept saying to them, please don't let him die. Please don't let him die. You have to save him. Seconds later, to Nancy's relief, Walt opens his eyes. When I came to, and the paramedics were working on me, I thought, I'm in trouble. I've got some serious problems. They got him stable enough that they could find a faint pulse and the blood pressure. They loaded him up into the ambulance. When the ambulance pulled up to the hospital, all you can see is everything's happening so fast. And there's doctors, nurses around you. They saw his blood pressure. And they said to me, he is extremely, extremely critical. Because the pressure was so low, they were trying to pump as much IV saline solution as they could to try to regain blood pressure. The IV transfers water directly into Walt's bloodstream, increasing the volume of fluid in his blood vessels, and as a result, the amount of pressure against the blood vessel walls. The fluid was helping him, but I could not take my eyes off the blood pressure machine, and it still was not raising up the blood pressure as much as what I thought it should. Unsure of what's causing his low blood pressure, the doctors begin running a battery of tests. But before they get back any results, a frightening new symptom sets in. I started getting pain in my legs. It started gradually, then it started getting progressively worse. It really is like someone poured gasoline on my legs and set them on fire. This absolutely came out of nowhere. I had never seen somebody in that much pain. They had connected the morphine to the IV and immediately the pain subsided. Now I was starting to worry about my condition and why I was there. The doctors kept saying to me, we have no idea what is wrong with him. We'll wait for the blood work to come back. Two hours later, the findings are in and they're nothing short of shocking. He said that you have low white blood cell count and that the severe pain that you have in your leg, maybe you have the flesh eating disease. They said to me that they had one a couple months ago and the symptoms were exactly the same. Flesh eating disease or necrotizing fasciitis is a fast moving infection that corrodes the skin from the inside out and often results in death. Most people do not survive this. I knew that most people, their organs shut down. I was extremely terrified. How does this happen that you go from low blood pressure to something that's critical and life-threatening? This was really upsetting. It's really starting to worry me. Am I gonna make it out of this hospital? Just four hours ago, Walt Breidigan's blood pressure fell so low, paramedics could barely find a pulse. Now, doctors have an entirely new but equally pressing concern. Walt may have contracted a deadly flesh-eating disease. Right before they took Walt up to do the testing, I said to him, Walt, I want you to give me a promise that no matter what, you will fight to the very end because I cannot live without you. I gave her my promise I'd stay alive. I've never broke promise to her, but I didn't think it was gonna last many more days. The wait for the test results is agonizing. But a little over an hour later, they get the answer they've been praying for. And the doctor said to us, all the results came back negative. We do not believe that he has flesh-eating disease. I think there were 12 doctors that were checking on me, and no one really had an idea why I was there. The doctors at that point said, we're going to put him in ICU. There, Dr. Gregory Fino, an intensive care specialist, is put in charge of Walt's unusual case. The most concerning part of Walt's admission was that he had very low blood pressure. The first treatment is fluids, fluids, fluids. My problem was I did not understand why his blood pressure was very low to start out with. Throughout that night, 
the medical team continues to administer fluids in an effort to keep Walt's blood pressure up. They came to me and said to me, you cannot stay in the hospital. He is too sick. And as I was walking out of the hospital, I kept thinking to myself, I cannot go home without him. What will I do? But by the time Nancy and their daughter Lindsay arrived the next morning, Walt's developed a grotesque and terrifying new symptom, unlike anything the doctors have seen before. Dr. Fino said, we need to prepare you for what you're going to see when you walk in. But I was never, ever prepared for what I saw. I could not believe it. His face when I went in, it didn't even look like he had any features. It just looked like this plain, blown up balloon. I actually would have said that it was not my husband. It didn't even, didn't even look like him. I could barely even recognize his, his face. When I saw the look on Nancy, and then I saw the look on Lindsay, I can tell that there's something wrong and grotesque. I begged Nancy, you have to let me look at my face. So I grabbed the mirror out of my purse, and I showed him. When she raised the mirror and let me look, it's like looking at a picture. All you can see is the face of a, maybe a ghoul or a goblin. It was a faceless person. Even though I gave her my promise I'd stay alive, and I love her so much, I just didn't think I'd keep that promise. Walt had one of the most dramatic water weight gains that I have ever seen in my life. Within 24 hours, he gained about 100 pounds. While doctors are baffled by the transformation, one thing is clear. If something isn't done soon, Walt's skin could literally burst. Dr. Fino explained to me that if I didn't start going down in size, that the skin wouldn't be able to take it, and they would have to cut me to relieve the pressure. So what you have to do is called a fasciotomy. And that's just a medical term for making an incision from the back of the knee down to the ankle and just filleting like you would fillet a fish open to let all the excess pressure out so the blood could flow. I just begged him not to cut me. There is one other option on the table. Administer a diuretic medication a drug that will force Walt's body to begin eliminating fluid naturally. To get rid of fluid, they stimulate the kidney, and you're taking more fluid out, and you're passing it in your urine. But I was very, very concerned that if I give diuretics, it could drop his blood pressure again. I was between the proverbial rock and a hard place, but I decided to give him diuretics. I did not know for sure if I was going to make it through this. The waiting was almost unbearable. But after a few hours, the diuretics begin to drain the excess fluid from Walt's body without drastically lowering his blood pressure. Dr. Fino said the swelling has stopped, so we're not going to have to cut him. And I thought, oh, that's fantastic. And over the next several days, Walt's blood pressure finally stabilizes. It was my belief that at that time he may have had a viral illness like a cold that just caused an inflammation in his blood vessels and swelling and resulted in the low blood pressure and all of his problems. But really felt that this was a self-limited condition. Dr. Fino said to me, I'm 99.9% .9 sure it will never happen again. Relieved and shaken, Walt and Nancy head home, eager to put the whole nightmarish episode behind them. But it's not an easy task. They must now come to terms with a distressing reality. Because of all the swelling, Walt developed the condition called foot drop because the nerve that allows you to lift your foot up got compressed and Walt required special braces and a lot of physical therapy. Dr. Fino said, you're not going to be able to do the things you used to be able to do. To Walt, he was like, okay, fine, the foot drop, if that's all I got out of this ordeal, I'm okay with it. Walt was not going to accept the fact that he had to come home with braces. Walt was always the type of guy that did everything for himself. 
after about halfway through with the physical therapy, I started getting some confidence that I could take the braces off. He worked every day at learning how to walk on his own, and the day that he could walk without the braces was a great relief for him. Three long months later, Walt is nearly back to his old self. Once I got rid of the braces, life was getting back to normal. You know, Nance and I were starting to take walks again. He was just like the old husband that I had back before. We just counted our blessings and moved forward. For the next two years, we were a totally happy family. We never really even talked about it anymore. But the Bridegans' problems are far from over. A little over two years after the attack that nearly killed him, Walt wakes up one morning feeling sweaty and exhausted. I got in the flu, which I never thought anything about it because Nancy had gotten the same flu. But later that same day, Nancy hears a terrifyingly familiar noise coming from the upstairs bathroom. I go rushing into the bathroom and he was passed out on the floor. And I'm thinking, no, this can't be happening. Please do not let this happen to him again. I said, Nance, it's back. It's the same thing. I know it. You got to get me to the hospital now. I really didn't think that we would be able to survive this, this time around. I kept thinking, I know we're not going to make it through this one. He's not going to be strong enough. My mind started racing. How could he have another attack of this? So I called 911. The paramedics come. He said his blood pressure is so low. And I said, I know. This happened before. They hooked him up to the IV again and took him to the emergency room. And there's a lot of people around. The doctors are starting to run to assist you. It's a really bad feeling. Alarmed at Walt's vanishingly low blood pressure readings, ER doctors once again pump him with fluids in an effort to raise it. I was really, really starting to swell up. And in my mind, I kept thinking, are we going to blow up like that again? By chance, the specialist who spearheaded his case during the last attack, Dr. Gregory Fino, is on duty at the hospital when he hears that Walt is back. I was in the intensive care unit when he came to the hospital. I thought, here's an instant replay of two years ago. This could not have been a virus the second time around. I've got to dig further because something else is going on and I've found a syndrome that was described in 1960 it was a case report of a very very rare disease and he fit the picture perfectly Dr. Fino came in and he had this article in his hand and he said Walt I think I know what's wrong with you I told Walt and Nancy based on the swelling and the recurrence, his diagnosis best fits with the condition called systemic capillary leak syndrome. Systemic capillary leak syndrome is an extremely rare disorder in which capillary walls actually leak fluid. In healthy individuals, capillaries transport blood and water throughout the body. But in patients like Walt, the capillaries suddenly develop holes causing water to leak out and blood pressure to plummet. The capillary is the very smallest blood vessel that carries blood and water so the tissues can get their nutrients. So they're like very small garden hoses. His garden hoses or capillaries had little holes on the side of them and stuff leaked out. I said, well, this is great. You know, after all these years, I now know what I got. Unfortunately, Dr. Fino can't explain why Walt suddenly developed the disease after so many years of good health. Systemic capillary leak syndrome is a mystery as to what causes it. We doctors just don't know. It's just one of those odd diseases for which I have no explanation why he went from 2005 until 2007 without symptoms. But it's clear that when Walt passed out two years earlier, the disease had just set in. You have leakage of water out of the bloodstream, and your blood pressure drops. And when you get very, very low blood pressure, the brain doesn't get enough blood and oxygen, and you faint. 
As the water continued to leak out of Walt's capillaries, it began to build up in his surrounding tissue, ultimately triggering the severe leg pain that doctors mistook for a flesh-eating disease. He had all of this fluid outside of his blood vessels in his legs. The major nerve in his leg got compressed, and blood vessels got compressed, so the muscles weren't getting enough oxygen. Ironically, the more fluids doctors administered to stabilize Walt's blood pressure, the more water leaked out of his capillaries, causing the grotesque swelling. If you have a couple gallons of water in your blood system, 90% of that water leaked out of the blood system into his arms and legs. We also gave fluids intravenously, and he got more and more swollen. With a diagnosis finally in hand, the question now is how to treat his disease before it kills him. If he really lost even more fluid out of his blood, all of his organs may have just shut down because they didn't get any oxygen. Organ failure in Walt was severe and life-threatening. He was as close to not making it as I've seen. I was probably the most scared in my life. Walt Breidigan has just been diagnosed with a deadly condition called systemic capillary leak syndrome. Unfortunately, the disease is so rare, doctors aren't even sure how to treat it. You gotta figure a way to stop the leaks. All these little holes in the capillaries somehow need to be plugged up. We gave what's called albumin intravenously. Albumin is a protein that can, in some cases, get fluid out of the space outside of the blood vessels and suck it back into the blood vessels. So I said, I can't tell you for sure this is going to work, but we've got to try something. And so I'm sitting there thinking the worst, like what would I do without him? I think within maybe four to seven hours after he started the IV, it was just a fresh, normal feeling, and it worked quite well. That was a big relief, knowing that at least there's something out there that can help him. But the grim reality is that the fix may only be temporary. Although the treatment appears to have closed up the existing holes in Walt's capillaries, new ones can open at any time and without warning. We had talked with Dr. Fino, you know, what the possible triggers are, and he said there was no recorded list of the triggers. Unfortunately, Walt will need to be carefully monitored for the rest of his life and treated in the hospital at the first sign of a major recurrence. But despite the difficult prognosis, the 50-year-old is lucky to be alive. Walt's systemic capillary leak syndrome, had it not been properly diagnosed, would no doubt in my mind have taken his life. But while Walt and Nancy are forever grateful for everything Dr. Fino has done for them, they can't help but wonder why the disease wasn't diagnosed when it first surfaced two years earlier. The first time Walt was admitted, he was sick with a viral cold-like illness, and so was his family. So that was the direction that I went the second time around. This could not have been a virus because he had recurred. So I better look a little bit further and do a little more intensive investigation. We think there's hundreds or thousands that have had it that didn't live through the first episode. Right now, we think there's less than 50 in the world. Systemic capillary leak syndrome is the rarest disease that I have ever encountered in my 30 or so years of medicine. Today, four years since his first attack, Walt has learned how to manage his condition. With capillary leak syndrome, the leaks will continue. With mine, I leak usually once a week, but one thing that I'm blessed with is that I can tell when it's getting serious. And I go straight to the emergency room. I have a bracelet that tells them exactly what to do. Walt is very lucky. He's one of the ones who have lived the longest with it. There's a sense of hope. I think every time the attacks get easier. We're still together. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary. 
My plan for the future is to be able to celebrate my 100th wedding anniversary with Walt. I gave her my promise I'd stay alive. Now we're years later. We're still able to spend a lot of time together. I'm alive. And I think it's really all I need. While Walt Breidigan's symptoms were so extreme, they couldn't be dismissed. It took more than four years before any doctor identified Ashley Mullinax's strange behavior as a sign of a deadly disease. In 1998, finance analyst Amy Perryman and Marine recruiter John Mullinax had been divorced for two years. But they still had one thing in common, their love for their four-year-old daughter, Ashley. Ashley was the center of attention and everything that we did. She was a great kid. We tried to make sure that whatever was best for Ashley, we, we followed. There were pictures of Ashley, John, and myself at his place, and there were pictures of us as a family at my house. She seemed to not even be bothered by it. And despite the divorce, Ashley seems to be leading a charmed life. Ashley was extremely healthy. She never seemed to get sick. When Ashley was young, two, three, all up four years old, she was just a normal kid. But shortly after her fourth birthday, Ashley develops a habit that her parents find puzzling. Ashley would come to me several times a day and request water. She just started drinking more and more. It was very strange. She would just refill a 20 ounce bottle of water seven or eight times a day, two times an hour that wasn't normal for children her age. She's drinking a lot of water, but my goodness, she goes to the restroom eight, 10 times during daylight hours. That's crazy. Then the bedwetting started. It was almost a nightly occurrence. We had to go out and buy rubber sheets for the mattress to protect them. It was becoming quite a problem for her, and I found that to be bizarre. I called and made an appointment for Ashley to see her pediatrician just for a routine physical. The doctor started to run some basic tests, and then we began talking about this incessant thirst. And the doctor had mentioned specifically, these are key symptoms of diabetes. We need to have her screen. Juvenile diabetes is a disorder in which a child's body is unable to regulate its glucose levels. Unless carefully managed, the disease can be fatal. I could have never imagined when I held her in my arms for the first time that I ever would be contemplating these issues. It is difficult any time you think that your child may have an illness. This is going to be a child who is crossing the monkey bars one minute and the next minute having to monitor what her blood sugar is. But when the findings come in, they leave the young parents with more questions than answers. The doctor came in and told us that Ashley's glucose levels were normal. Ashley does not have diabetes. I asked the doctor if there was any other concern that I needed to have as far as her drinking so much water. And they told me everything was fine. We really had no choice but to accept the diagnosis. But despite the doctor's assurances, Ashley's compulsive drinking continues to intensify. And by the end of the year, she's going through up to 20 bottles of water a day. Ashley would try to sneak water all the time. She'd sneak bottles of water, and I would find them under her bed. I was thinking, there has to be limits. Nothing made sense. We didn't know where to go with it. Over the course of three years, we went and saw five to six pediatricians. And there was never an answer. It always came back the same, you know, negative for diabetes. Doctors confirmed with us and reassured us that there was absolutely nothing wrong with Ashley. Not sure where to turn next, Amy and John do their best to manage the strange behavior. But it isn't long before Ashley's teachers begin to express their own concerns. When Ashley was in school, her teacher came to me and she said Ashley was going to the restroom sometimes twice an hour. So when you add up all that time, we're talking 16, 20 times a day. When I would be in class, I would always have to use the bathroom over and over and over again. And 
and the teachers would always get really annoyed with me. It was frustrating because I didn't know what I was doing wrong. You know, why can't I not be thirsty? Making matters worse, the excessive amounts of water she's consuming are beginning to take a toll on her body. Two to three times a week, I would get her up from school and she would drink a bunch of water and I would say, Ashley, stop drinking so much water, you're gonna make yourself sick. And right before we would leave for me to take her to school, she'd get sick to her stomach and vomit. And there wasn't even any substance to it. It was all water because it was so early it just filled my stomach up with water and there was nothing else in it. And I, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> you would end up vomiting. It was just from drinking water and that, you know, that's alarming. But whatever it is, it's gone to the point to where now she's physically ill from drinking water. It's a lot for an eight-year-old to deal with. But shortly after the end of the school year, Ashley begins to develop an entirely new and painful symptom. I started having the headache. It was horrible. It was very throbby, like something was squeezing my eyes. And just over and over and over, it was really bad. So I gave her some over-the-counter medication, and she seemed to go on about her business. A headache's a headache, they'll pass. So I didn't think too much of it at first. But after four days, Ashley's excruciating headache still hasn't subsided. She's just, she's not feeling any better and the pain is getting worse. I knew something was very wrong, so we rushed directly to the doctor's office. He said she sounded a little congested and probably had a sinus infection. The doctor prescribed antibiotics to treat the infection. I felt very confident this was all just going to blow over and she was going to be fine. But the agonizing headaches don't go away. In fact, they intensify. Over the course of the next three weeks, we went to two other pediatricians because this sinus infection wasn't getting any better. And um, all of them prescribed different antibiotics. None of them provided any relief. I just wanted the pain to go away. Then, just when Ashley thinks things can't get any worse, another frightening symptom sets in out of the blue. I noticed she was covering her left eye. I pulled her hand away and I said, Ashley, what are you doing? And I explained to her, I see two of you. Like, you're right here, but then there's another you right here. Her left eye was turning in towards her nose and looking over towards the right instead of looking straight ahead. I was deathly afraid. So we rushed directly to the doctor's office. As soon as we got to the doctor's office, he's looking in her eyes. He turns and he looks at me and the blood just ran out of his face. This is not a normal happening. He was very, very concerned. Immediately, he sent us to the hospital to have an MRI. I felt like the wind had been sucked out of me. We got in the car and just started driving. I immediately called John and said, there is something seriously wrong with Ashley. What is it that these doctors have missed? It scared me to death to know something is definitely wrong with my daughter. I got in the car and raced to the hospital. It was scary because I didn't know what was going on. As soon as they arrive at the emergency room, the on-call doctor orders an MRI of her brain. I was beyond concerned. It was becoming, I'm afraid. What, what is going on? Things are moving very quickly now. All kinds of things just run through your mind at once. But nothing could have prepared John and Amy for what the MRI reveals. One of the physicians came to us and stated that we have found a tumor in my daughter's brain. And I just, I looked at John and I said, this can't happen. This can't happen to our baby. I just leaned up against the wall and I just slid down the wall. It was hard. Everything I'd ever heard about a tumor was bad. Just knowing the worst is in store for your daughter, it's heart wrenching. For all these weeks, I had said, you know, 
Oh, it's just a headache. There's nothing wrong with her. And now she has a tumor in her brain. How do you go to that? How do you get past that? Eight-year-old Ashley Mullinax has been experiencing baffling symptoms for more than four years. First, an insatiable thirst, then blinding headaches and double vision. Now, her parents have just learned that a golf ball-sized tumor is growing in her brain. At this point, they don't know what kind of tumor it is. They don't know how it originated. What are you going to do for my child? You've got to save her. What are you going to do? The worst case scenario always rolls through your mind. That was um, the worst day of my life. They didn't know what was going on, and I didn't know why all this stuff was happening. That was the scariest thing for me. Ashley is immediately admitted to the pediatric cancer clinic. And oncologist Dr. Stuart Gold is assigned to her case. Ashley presented to us with a history of having a headaches, some changes in her vision, as well as trouble with urinating too much and drinking too much. Ashley had a, a mass on her MRI in the third ventricle in the area of the pineal gland. The pineal gland is a centrally located area of the brain where many vital nerves and glands intersect. It was explained to me that Ashley had a golf ball sitting in the soul of her brain. That the soul was where all of the neuropathways connected and crossed. But as dire as Ashley's condition is, the doctors can't treat her until they determine exactly what kind of tumor she has. We get clues on MRI scans of what things may be, but we never know what they are for sure until we have a biopsy and can look at it under a microscope. We needed surgery to confirm the diagnosis. It was like living in a virtual nightmare, that somebody was going to have their hands inside of her brain. Trying to get a piece of tissue, sometimes you can have bleeding, you can have other complications that could lead to death or neurologic consequences. There was a 10% chance that Ashley would not survive the surgery at all. But it was explained to me that not doing the surgery it was about a 100% chance of death. When we had to wheel her into surgery, that was the hardest thing I have ever done in my entire life. We had to take a long trip down the hallway to the OR. The hardest part was when the doors closed. You don't know. Waiting for Ashley to come out of surgery was agonizing. We didn't know she'd make it through. It was the longest time of my life. With each passing moment, John and Amy's anxiety only deepens. Finally, after an excruciating five hours, the OR doors swing open. The surgeon came out and she was smiling and she said, the surgery went well. After surgery, the biopsy confirmed that Ashley had a pineal germinoma. A pineal germinoma is a rare type of brain tumor that is formed by germ cells. In healthy individuals, germ cells play a key role in determining the sex of a fetus. But in patients like Ashley, for unknown reasons, the germ cells travel to the brain and wreak havoc on multiple neurological systems. Knowing that this had been growing in Ashley's brain for her entire life, that immediately shocked me. Germinoma evolves somewhere in the development of the embryo as cells called germ cells migrate to the wrong area and they take up home and grow abnormally and cause a tumor. As tumors grow in the area of the pineal and the pituitary gland, they can destroy the pituitary gland. As this happens, the pituitary gland can no longer do its basic function, making hormones that help regulate the body. In Ashley's case, one of those hormones controlled the production of urine and led to a rare condition called diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is when you cannot concentrate your urine. So you keep urinating and urinating, even you get dehydrated and you drink and drink, and it actually looks quite a bit like childhood with diabetes, but it's not. For years and years, doctors kept looking at me saying, all the blood tests are normal, when in all actuality, the blood tests weren't normal. They just weren't testing for the right thing. And as the tumor in her brain grew bigger, it led directly to Ashley's other symptoms. 
The tumor blocked the flow of her spinal fluid. This caused a backup of pressure, and this caused her headaches. Ashley had double vision because she had increased pressure in her brain, causing pressure on the brain stem. More than four years after Ashley's first symptoms set in, Amy and John finally understand what's wrong with their child. And it raises the question as to why it took so long to identify the critical clues. Childhood cancers and tumors are very rare. I have been a pediatric oncologist here at UNC for about 20 years. We've seen a pineal germinoma a handful of times. But while the surgery to diagnose the condition is a critical step, Ashley's ordeal is far from over. First, doctors need to determine if the eight-year-old suffered damage to her brain during the operation. Although the surgery was a success, we were still not out of the woods. We needed to see if there were any effects from surgery. The first question that I asked Ashley when she woke up was, how many mommies do you see? And I said, one. And she kind of broke down a little bit. I was tired, but I didn't hurt. My head didn't hurt. It was such a relief to know that you know, she's okay. Right in that moment, everything's fine. Still, the worried parents must now face another harsh reality. Ashley will have to undergo treatment to shrink the tumor in her brain. Dr. Gold initiated a plan for Ashley to go through three rounds of chemotherapy and six weeks of radiation. I was a little upset that I had to shave my head. After I did it, though, I was okay with it. I could wear a hat at school, which was really cool because all the other kids couldn't. <laughs> I learned by far that my daughter was one of the strongest individuals I will ever encounter in my entire life. At the end of all the uh, chemotherapy and then the radiation treatments, they did another MRI and the tumor was gone. This is when finally I could take a breath of air. But while the gravest threat to Ashley's health, the tumor has been successfully treated. She suffered extensive damage to her pituitary gland and will need to take hormone replacements for the rest of her life. Everything that the brain would actually direct as far as hormone has to be directed medicinally. So her weight is directly affected, her metabolism is directly affected, and the diabetes insipidus, all of that is regulated through medications that she has to take on a daily basis. The tumor did the damage, but still, we're pretty lucky. We were told that if the tumor had gone undiagnosed and untreated, Ashley would have probably had a stroke and she would have, she would have died. Left untreated, Ashley's tumor would have been fatal. Anybody that has a kid, you know, they're really lucky to you know, have that gift. To have it almost taken away from you, it's frightening. Today, despite her brush with death, Ashley is thriving. I've been tumor-free for seven years now. All my hair has grown back. I'm 15, and I'm very happy now. She's a normal girl again. It's just a good feeling to know that we're going to have her for a lot longer. The fact that we almost lost her and the fact that we have had this second chance with her, it makes every moment special. The glass is never half empty anymore. It's always half full.